Austin Dillon held a trophy for the fifth time in his life. Joey Logano did a burnout and Ty Majeski went back to back. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show, the weekly recap of what happened in racing this past weekend. And man, did some things happen. We, of course, had Austin Dillon go out there and wreck two different leaders in two separate incidents on the last lap, in the last like 1,000 feet of the race, something I don't think we've ever seen before. Larry McReynolds, Darrell Waltrip, have you ever? No, I've never actually seen something like that happen. And we'll get to it. I've put out a recap video about Richmond. I talked about the Austin Dillon thing late on Sunday night, put out a video about that as well. So if you want my thoughts on that, they're mostly all there. I'm not going to make everybody sit through another 10 minute dissertation on what I think was going on here. But I will talk about some of the fan reaction that came out of this. A lot of fans were like, that was Dale Sr. driving that car on Sunday night. That's what Austin needed to do. Joey got his. Remember Kansas in 2015 with Matt Kansas? Well, I think Matt got him back, if we're being completely honest. At Martinsville, some people seem to forget about that. Is Joey Logano a saint in this situation? No, absolutely not. He's He's done a bump and run before. And I'll say, I'm not that upset about the bump and run ish issue. Did Austin Dillon have any intention of making that corner without wrecking Joey Logano? No, I don't think so. And the fact that he was actually able to get to Logano with enough power to spin him out was is honestly kind of impressive because he was about three car lengths back. And to hit somebody and spin them out in this car, you got to hit them pretty pretty decently, decently hard. And he was able to do that. But I'm not super upset about the bump and run. We've seen it happen before. Is it dirty? Yeah. Is, should it be penalized? I mean, the car store would certainly penalize somebody for doing this. A lot of short tracks around the country, especially in, you know, late models would, you know, uh, penalize somebody for doing this. But we've seen it happen before and the precedent hasn't ever been set as a penalty. So I'm not that upset about that. It's the Denny Hamlin portion of this and wrecking another guy going for the lead like it's a video game. He went all NASCAR heat five and was like, if I, I'm not going to let you win. Bam, bam, sliding back and forth. That's kind of where I think it's a little bit too aggressive. You have a spotter telling him to wreck him, wreck him. And you can say in the heat of the moment, he didn't know. Austin Dillon said after the race, his reaction was to essentially wreck Denny Hamlin right there. Uh, and I think that's probably where you got to draw the line. But I think if Austin Dillon does that, but we don't have the 22 of Joe Lagan and the 11 of Denny Hamlin, say it's the five of Kyle Larson and the nine of Chase Elliott, the fan reaction coming out of Sunday night would be vastly vastly different. It would certainly not be this putting Austin on a pedestal type of situation. And for all the people that kept going, you know, saying over his career that Austin Dillon's a disgrace to the three car, and now they're all on the internet, you know, Sunday night, Monday morning, saying that Dale Sr. was driving that car, Dale would be proud. I don't think Dale would have been that proud, if we're being completely honest. Yeah, Dale had his run-ins. He certainly wrecked people in the past, did it at Richmond, did it at uh, Martins, or Bristol. He's done it before. But I don't think that he would, you know, sign off on a guy hooking somebody in the right rear and turning them into the fence. And of course, people are like, well, Denny Hamlin, he's the one that caused that wreck. He pushed up on corner exit. Well, Denny was following the racing line. I don't know if people know this. Richmond's a D-shaped oval. So when you come off of turn four onto the front stretch right there, you kind of follow the D. You don't, you know, continue to hook it and continue down like where the apron would be at like a traditional style racetrack. No, he follows the corner on corner exit. You, Your steering opens up. When you're on corner exit there, he followed the racing line. Austin was below, above the white line, ended up below the white line, and contact was made with the 11 car it's on Austin. It was, as much as people want to say that it was a Denny Hamlin issue. So what's unfortunate is what happened before that you know, whole nonsense on the green white checker was actually a really, really compelling race. The multiple different tire compounds was a massive hit. Hats off to NASCAR and Goodyear for doing that. I think a lot of us were skeptical, myself included, going into this race. I'm like, is it really going to be that big of a factor? And it absolutely was. Those having that option tire, the soft tire, was the exact reason why Daniel Suarez was able to win stage two. His team put him on early in stage two. He drove through the field, got that track position, put himself in contention to win stage two, and he went ahead and did that. Yeah, those tires played a massive factor. We had the most on-track passes for the lead that we've ever had at Richmond before, and it was compelling. Now, I hope NASCAR brings it to every track. We had Denny Hamlin earlier in the weekend uh, champion, campaigning to get that soft tire to just be the standard tire on short tracks. And I think that would actually be really compelling as well because you're going to have guys that conserve tires. You're going to have guys that burn them off too quickly. And it's going to make for a lot of comers and goers. Nobody send that to NASCAR come. So, or NASCAR, whatever it is. But I think it would be really entertaining if they were able to to do that bring it to road courses as well bring it to short tracks and road courses for the rest of the year i think it could make for pretty good racing other than that you had a great battle between josh barry and bo wallace early on in that race you had 
not a lot of like on track incidents. Rather, you Martin Trex Jr. losing his mind, Martin Trex Jr. losing an engine, and those JGR engines were, you know, continue to be absolutely unreliable. It's just. I don't know what their problem is, but, you know, they had an issue at the Brickyard 400 before the summer break. Now they come out at Richmond, have another issue there as well. But for the most part, this race top to bottom was actually really entertaining. And then it just, of course, gets shrouded in controversy by what happened at the finish of the race. And, you know, I, there's a lot of fans on either side of the issue. I don't think that on the topic of, you know, will Austin Dillon get penalized for this? I... He's not going to get his win taken away. I think NASCAR might fine him monetary and points fine at that. Hooking somebody in the right rear, precedent has been set that that you know equals a one race suspension. Chase Elliott got suspended for it, Bubba Wallace has been suspended for it. Lane Riggs got parked two laps for rough driving, and I know NASCAR had warned Lane Riggs before that, but when you compare the rough driving that Lane Riggs got a two lap penalty for to what Austin Dillon did, I mean they are apples and oranges, as Jordan Bianchi said on the teardown, but they're apples and oranges because what Austin did is far more egregious than what Lane did. So uh, it's a tough one. I think Austin does get a penalty. I think he remains in the playoffs. He went from 32nd to now locked into the playoffs. NASCAR used to have a top 30 rule. You had to be in the top 30 uh, in points to be able to be playoff eligible if you want to race or not. And they got rid of that. This is the first full season, I believe, of that rule. And, you know, maybe they wish they had it back. And I know there's a lot of people on the Internet that are trying to dunk on anybody that talks about this. Uh, by saying he's 26 in points, it doesn't even matter. Well, there's still three races to go. And as poorly as that team has run this year, including having a wild card race at Daytona, there is a solid chance that he could fall, absolutely fall out of the top 30 in points. So you can get your dunks in, but I mean, just look at numbers here and be like, oh, yeah, well, there is still a strong possibility that he could drop out of that top 30. Not like he's ran super well all year. He hasn't been able to beat the other cars out there. He hardly could beat uh, Zane Smith and Harrison Burton. Uh, in the points and now you're like well he's top 30 okay got some interesting dms from people uh from sunday night into monday uh, people that are not happy with me at all actually there was one that made me laugh so hard i didn't actually read the entire message here i'll put it up on the screen so you guys can see it he started off with did you probably don't even watch racing did you probably don't even Hey, buddy, you're going to start a you're going to start a message off like that. I just not reading the rest of it at, at that because I can only assume that it's going to go massively downhill from there. But did you don't even watch? Uh, did you do not even watch? Do you do? I'm sure in some part of the country that makes some sense. But uh, grammar wise, I, I have a college degrees over here somewhere. I didn't learn any of that in college which might actually be the problem. But moving on from the Cup Series race, I probably, before the wreck, would have given it like 83 to 85. After the wreck, probably around a 60. Just, yeah, didn't feel great after what we saw there. And then in the post-race, you have Austin Dillon being like, I was doing whatever I had to do to win. Okay, I get that. Saying that it was a reaction to turn down in the Denny Hamlin is an interesting choice of words right there. And his PR, if they have PR over at Richard Chose Racing, I'm starting to think that they probably don't, or at least they're not the best. If I was his PR person, I would have grabbed him before the post-race presser and been like, blame this on the playoff system. Go into that presser and be like, hey, this is the box that NASCAR puts us in. And he's like, I don't want to do that. But unfortunately, I have to do that to qualify for the playoffs and push that blame off onto the playoff system. And he didn't because why would he? This is the same guy that said that he had the right to bear arms, B-A-R-E, bear arms. So not shocked that he didn't have the PR knowledge to kind of steer it in a certain direction. You can dictate the narrative coming out of that if you wanted to, or at least try to steer it. And they didn't do it. Then you have, uh, then you have Richard Childers talking about kicking dogs. And sometimes you'll get bit again and then saying that you shouldn't believe everything on the Internet. When somebody asked him about his spotter saying wreck him, wreck him. And he said, nobody said that. Don't believe everything you say on the Internet. Then they played it for him. And he was just like, ah, you know, typical kind of old boomer. Ah, you know, that's the woke media <laughs> or something like that. So, yeah, the whole ending of that race was perplexing. Then you have Joey Logano coming down pit road, doing a burnout in front of Austin Dillon's crew. And his kids were there. 
sending the kids out on the pit road. I said it last night, sending the kids out on the front stretch with Austin was a very smart, maybe that was actually where their PR was focused at. Sending them out there onto the front stretch with him definitely assured that Joey wasn't going to go out there and try to fight him because you're not going to try to fight him when you have your kids around. That's just a bad look for everybody involved. So for Austin, smart move there. For Denny to do a burnout in front of Austin's kids, yeah, I can get why his family and people would be upset about that. Super loud, especially that up close. And um, yeah, not not the best look there. NASCAR officials went down and absolutely scolded Logano. And he apologized in the moment. You could see him talking to one of the officials and being like, my bad. And I think the official did at the very end say, we're good. Just, you know, don't do that. I would expect it, uh, Joey to probably get a penalty on Tuesday for that. It is unsafe is, is what it comes down to. And NASCAR has a precedent and a, a history of penalizing people for doing things like that on pit road after the race, at least in recent years. So I would say that he probably will receive some sort of monetary fine if I was going to guess there. But NASCAR is fully back, right? We had two weeks off of not talking about anything now Austin Dillon gave us enough to talk about until we get through Michigan. It's just, we're back. <laughs> the Olympics was exciting and the NASCAR comes out on Sunday night and just absolutely delivers. But I think there probably has to be some sort of line drawn here because you're really flirting with um, professional wrestling and sport. And right now they're really teetering in the middle and they're in a bad situation. I get it, right? I can sympathize with what NASCAR has to deal with here. I just think that, man, at some point, I feel like you got to put your foot down on some of this. And I would, I, if I was guessing, I think there's probably some people at NASCAR that are very much on the side of like penalize Austin Dillon. Probably some people would have advocated to strip his win away at the end there. And I think there's certainly some people on the marketing side that are like, this is great for business, at, at least in terms of eyeballs and clicks that we're going to get. And that's the toss up, right? I understand it. But I think at some point you have to limit the amount of destruction somebody can cause at the end of the race, uh, especially. So we'll wait and see what NASCAR says on Tuesday. But I don't necessarily know if I expect anything major to come out of the Austin Dillon situation for that. Today's video is sponsored by Driven Sunglasses. Hat and shirt on today. Head over to drivensunglasses.com. Check out what they have on offer. Use code BREAKCARD for 20% off plus free shipping. I am very much a fan of the classic sunglasses as well as the camber sunglasses. These ones right here. So drivensunglasses.com. Josh Berry, SVG, myself. We all wear them. See if they have a pair that fits you today. Moving on to the other race we had this weekend. That would be the NASCAR Truck Series race on Saturday night from Richmond as well. It was the final race of the regular season for them, and Ty Majeski went back-to-back. -back. He won at IRP before the summer break, uh, back when NASCAR was in Indianapolis on that Friday night. He goes to Richmond. He wins again. Back-to-back. -back. He should have won this race last year. Carson Hosvar ends up beating him at the end of the race. But for Majeski, he now sits P3 in the point standings heading into the playoffs. He's in a really, really strong spot, and he's hitting his stride at the right point of this year, right? Is this going to be a Ryan Blaney type of run for him? Ah, remains to be seen. He's really good on short tracks. He does, of course, have a win at Homestead. He he can get it done at you know at basically every track. Now they just have to put together a playoff run here. Christian Eckes ends up winning the regular season championship, which was funny in the moment because everybody on Twitter was like, hey, Christian Eckes won the championship, won the regular season title after the first stage. Fox was talking in the moment after the stage ended. They were like, and Eckes, he's still on his way to, you know, attempting to win the regular season title. We go back to racing stage two and they're like, Christian Eckes won the stage, the regular season title at the end of stage one. Like, ah, okay. Did you guys read Twitter? Finally there. Uh, overall, I thought that race was, Pretty good, top to bottom. The cup race definitely added in a bit of intrigue with the tires on it, but the trucks always put on a seemingly good race. It lived up to its title of the action track on Friday night. There was actually a ton of action uh, in that truck series race. You had multiple different, you actually had a lot of action in that race on Friday night. You had seven cautions, seven natural cautions, two of course for the stage break, multiple different wrecks. Thad Moffitt went all Arca breaks and wrecked into a crash that he had no business being in at that point. And then you had a really interesting points battle between Tanner Gray, Stuart Freeze, and Daniel Dye. Tanner Gray was locked in, uh, before the race started. And then Daniel Dye was five points to the bad. 
he was trying to make those points up, scored stage points, and on stage points alone, he was able to put himself back into the playoffs, and then he just ran better than um, than Tanner Gray all night. So shout out to friend of the program, Daniel Dye, for locking himself into the playoffs. First NASCAR Truck Series driver to ever point his way into, into the playoffs in the final race of the season. So there's something to be said about that. And for Daniel, I think it's a super solid run. P8 finish, I think he's shown that he belongs this year. And he's certainly developed a lot better as the season has started to progress here. And yeah, I mean, he contended at, at Nashville. If it wasn't for Eck is just being absolutely lights out. Uh, he was he was next up right there. And I think that he's, you know, turned the corner in terms of like being that guy that you can consistently depend on to run in the top 10 there. And that's just driver development, right? That's what happens with a lot of these guys. And it takes some time to, to get there. And I think Daniel certainly reached that spot at the moment. The top or from fifth to 10th in the truck series point standings is separated by eight points. It is going to be a massively tight battle over the first round in the truck series playoffs. You have, uh, they get back to action at Milwaukee and that's going to be an interesting one, right? I, I think Ty Majeski, you should expect him to be strong there. Uh, it's going to be uh, Corey Hyman, Christian Eck, because that, that's a championship battle right now, right? I think the biggest question is, will somebody, who are the other two that are going to join them at Phoenix? And well, we're going to find out over the next six races for the truck series. Only seven races left for those guys. Um, kind of wish there were more. Truck series continues to be one of the best series that NASCAR has out there. Of course, also this weekend, we had the Knoxville Nationals. Kyle Larson goes back to back, picks up his third Knoxville Nationals win in four years. Uh, you could argue his fourth and fifth year in five years. Rather, he won in 2020 when they called it the one and only because they didn't have the Nationals that year because of the pandemic. Uh, Larson kind of even alluded to that in his post-race interview on Saturday night, being like, ah, you know, we, we should have four and five years for this. But that guy has been absolutely lights out at Knoxville recently. The run of sprint, I mean, he's the last four, five sprint car races that he's been in. He's won. He won two World of Outlaw races at I-55, including the Ironman 55. He goes to Oski on Monday night, wins that. Goes to his qualifying night on Thursday, wins that. And then he goes ahead and wins the Knoxville Nationals. The guy is absolutely on fire right now. And he does this on a part-time basis, which is insane. Imagine if Kyle Larson ran full-time in the sprint car series, chased a World Outlaws title, chased a high limit title, sorry, high limit title. Um, it would be really interesting to see just how many wins he could stack in one full season. I mean, we kind of got to see it in 2020 and he won a lot of races that year. But for Larson, it had to hurt. But for Larson, it had to hurt the World of Outlaws to see him and their biggest rival standing in victory lane, flow racing on his chest, talking about how great it was to win Sprint Car's biggest race, which of course was on Dirt Vision, rival of flow racing, sanctioned by the world of outlaws rival of high limit which kyle larson owns but for larson massively good win giovanni selzy was uh p2 you had Corey day p3 uh the the 18 year old out of california who has looked super stout this year and continues to probably make that transition to asphalt racing one thing i saw this weekend that absolutely blew my mind was the nascar hey dudes collaboration that they will be doing hey dudes is a shoe company and if you've ever wanted to wear Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s late model paint scheme, Kyle Larson's paint scheme, or even Chase Elliott's paint scheme on your shoe, you're in luck because for $75, you'll be able to do that. Now, I had a ton of people in my replies on Twitter when I was like, who would be buying these that are like, these are the best shoes I've ever owned. These are fire. These slap, as the kids say. They are the bee's knee. Somebody insert Bill Hader in Pineapple Express right here. That's what they were saying about these shoes. And I'll be honest, they look a lot like bumper cars to me. They're not my style. They're not my demographic. I'm not in the demo for Hey Dudes, which shouldn't probably come as a shock to most people but i'm glad that people like them not my type of style and as i was watching that i was like or looking at these i was like we should really bring back remember when people were like what are those when they would point at people's shoes we should bring those back for these shoes but then i saw how excited people were and i was like hey man if people want to buy these and wear them to the racetrack i who am i to stop them have fun live your life i do know that those lime green dale jr sun drop shoes will absolutely be paired with a pair of red shorts and probably like a bright blue t-shirt because fashion it just doesn't matter at racetracks for the most part but for for everybody that wants to wear them hats off to you guys i they're just not my style but i'm glad people are excited about them i've just never had the urge to wear a paint scheme on my shoe before especially not shoes that look like that Moving on to what to watch for this weekend. 
on Friday at 6 p.m. on FS1, we have the ARCA 200 from Michigan. And then on Saturday at 3.30, we have the Xfinity Series race on USA. And Sunday at 2.30, we have the NASCAR Cup Series race on USA as well. We also have the IndyCar Series in action at Gateway on Saturday night at 6 p.m. So there's plenty of racing coming back. We're out of the Olympic break now. Formula One is still off for another week after after next uh two more weeks is probably the way i should have said that there but racing is fully back three races to go in the nascar cup series um regular season before we get to the playoffs remember the playoffs or the regular season does not end at daytona this year that is the penultimate round second to last it will end on the southern 500 at darlington and then we will head into the playoffs which include atlanta and talladega things are going to get a little bit wild so let me know in the comments what you thought about the weight the racing this weekend the show, like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.